Nicole Cook. I, I am the Augusta Baker Endowed Chair here at the University of South Carolina, and welcome to the Spring 2023 Baker Diversity Lecture Series. So beginning today for the next five weeks, we have some amazing speakers lined up. So we hope that you can join us and we hope that we'll have uh, some great conversation. So I see a lot of friends uh, in the audience. So glad to see you, see students from South Carolina uh, in 701 and 781. Um, also so glad to see you as well. So without uh, wasting any more time, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Sierra Harris, who is the Baker GA, who helps me run these wonderful series. So thank you, Sierra, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi friends, I am so excited to be back for another series of Baker Lectures. You all are in for a treat. Today I have the immense pleasure of introducing our speaker, but before I get into that, I want to go over our Zoom housekeeping rules really quickly. Um, so today's session will be recorded, and the recording will be sent out to every registered guest at the conclusion of the session. I just ask that you mute yourself during the presentation, but utilize the chat feature to ask questions and engage throughout. There will be a time where you will be encouraged to unmute yourself and ask any questions. So now let's get on to the good stuff. Our speaker today is Lessa Kananapua Paleo Lazada. She is the 2022 to 2023 president of the American Library Association and adult services assistant manager at Palos Verdes Library District in Southern California. She was the 2019 to 2022 executive director and 2016 to 2017 president of the Asian Pacific American Libraries Librarian Association. <clears throat> Excuse me, in 2022, she received the American Library Association Elizabeth Futa's Catalyst for Change Award and was named a Library Journal Mover and Shaker in the advocacy category. Much of her work focuses on adv advocating for equity, diversity, and inclusion in libraries and librarianship. She lives in San Pedro, California with her poet husband, Christian Haynes Lozada, and their plethora of pets. Let's all welcome Lessa. Thank you so much. Mahalo for the the introduction, Sierra, and aloha, aloha my koko attendees. It is so wonderful to be here in this virtual space with you all, kicking off the Augusta Baker Diversity Lecture Series, a big responsibility, which as you all know and just heard is jam-packed with amazing thought leaders and advocates from the library world. I've heard so many stories of bravery during my time as ALA president. And before I get into sort of the meat of my presentation, I hope you'll indulge me as I share some of those stories and experiences because nothing we are doing right now in libraries is easy. And the stories that I have heard throughout my travels, both in person and virtual since I took over as president in June, have demonstrated our resiliency, our desire to build strong communities through libraries, and our creativity in bringing our ancestral knowledge and power with us to do so, as well as just being inspiring and helping me to get through every day. So I was thrilled to create community over this past weekend at the Joint Conference of Librarians of Color, or also known as JCLC, which is an event that only happens every four years and is put on by volunteers from the five national associations of librarians of color which include the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, the American Indian Library Association, the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association, and the Chinese American Librarians Association. Having served on the steering committee for the 2018 JCLC, I know just how much effort goes into providing and creating a space where we can speak openly about the oppression and systemic barriers our librarians of color and our communities of color face every day in libraries. And I also remember as a first time attendee in 2012, I remember how life and career changing the event can be. When I attended my first JCLC, it was the first time I was able to put a name to things I'd experienced like microaggressions. It was also one of the first times I'd ever presented on a panel. And it was one of the most community embracing experiences I've ever had. And I was so happy to see so many first timers at the 2022 JCLC, and especially students as pictured here at the University of South Florida, to especially for JCLC this year, which was especially for a conference that was fraught with barriers to access, including a pandemic, including harmful legislation to our LGBTQ plus communities and BIPOC communities in Florida, 
and to hurricanes from mother nature. But overcome as we do, and we were able to connect with folks and hear stories of pain, but also perseverance. And folks telling each other to go where you're celebrated, not just tolerated or less, but also if you can't leave or you don't wanna leave and you wanna fight back, we've got you and we'll fight with you side by side. I also heard stories of those who are reluctant to lead because they don't wanna be tamped down by white supremacy or aren't invited to lead because they don't uphold oppress oppressive power structures. And I was inspired to think of how to bring the six C's of leadership, curiosity, cultural intelligence, cognizance, courage, collaboration, and commitment into an anti-racist leadership practice so that we can decide for ourselves whose job it is to disrupt, educate, or grow and empower ourselves to decide for ourselves where we fall on that line depending on the day. Because systemic change comes from anti-racist policies and ideals and it was encouraging to hear just how many libraries are moving past performative acts into true change. And internationally, when I traveled to the Sharjah International Library Conference in the United Arab Emirates, I heard stories of connecting with soon to be patrons by doing things like embracing the oral traditions of elders, bringing in the desert sand literally into the library to show the connection between the outside where those folks who hadn't yet entered the library were comfortable and the inside of the library where they were going to be comfortable, creating for them a safe and secure space for everyone who walks through their doors. All things that resonate with me as a native Hawaiian librarian, although perhaps instead of desert sand, bringing in ocean water. And at the Association of Tribal Libraries, Archives and Museums Conference in Temecula, California in October, I heard from native Hawaiian librarians incorporating our traditional practices into library services and spaces, as well as our collections. By working together with educators, cultural practitioners, and other experts in language and culture, Librarians Dr. Siobhan Matsuda and Anne-Marie Paikai worked within the University of Hawaii library system to create indigenous controlled vocabularies and authority records that better represent and respect indigenous worldviews, resisting the status quo. And at the same conference featured here, library school student Ha'oli Hivahiva Moniz shared and demonstrated how tapping into our Hawaiian culture can not only teach students and their families the traditions that we've lost, but make the library space feel like home, resisting against colonization to create a fuller and more inclusive society. And at ALA's first library learning experience conference or LibLearnX in New Orleans just two weeks ago, I had the distinct pleasure of co-hosting a panel with ALA president-elect Emily Drabinsky that focused on library workers organizing and activating through the years with a multi-generational panel of activists who set the path for librarians of color like Elizabeth Martinez, the first Latina ALA executive director who helped start the Spectrum Scholarship Program and was a former library director who built libraries across California like the new Cesar Chavez Library and the farm worker and dust bowl resident community in an agricultural community to advocates like Casey Boyd, who advocates on behalf of school librarians everywhere, but especially those in DC, and puts her livelihood on the line to do so. To panelist Candace Mack, who has sparked to advocacy by helping to rebuild New Orleans libraries after Katrina, and all the way to current library school student and longtime community organizer, Leslie Garrett, who advocates on behalf of those in the disability community and for justice for those who are incarcerated. All of these stories, all of these advocates, all of these library workers and supporters connect, build, and bring joy to their communities. Because building home and building community through information and learning is what brings me joy, and I'm sure brings you all joy in your work and in your schooling as you get ready. But it is not always easy for us as library workers and library lovers in an increasingly divided and chaotic world to do so. We must be brave as we build up. We have all had to be brave over the last few years while we have been asked to do the impossible both in libraries and our personal lives. We, whether formally or not, during virtual programs, virtual classes and reference calls, during curbside or with patrons in our libraries, we have asked to be first responders, trauma counselors, social workers and shelters, as well as places for information, discovery and rejuvenation. 
we have done all that we have been asked to do, and we have grown and reinvented what it means to be a library in every aspect of our work. We have followed in the role of the resistors and brave ones who came before us, both as library workers and as members of our communities. Because we had to be brave. We had to be brave for ourselves, for each other, and for the communities we are members of. Our brave communities have made it this far. We've made it fractured and some divided, but we've made it. And now it's time for us to restore, reconnect, and reflect on the voyage we're on as we imagine our vision of the future to move forward as together as we can be when it feels like we are under attack, burnt out, and fighting for our core values. So in our time together today, I'll share a bit about what roots my leadership style. I'll also share some updates on censorship challenges across the country. And I'll challenge us to do better, to grow, and to truly become the inclusive spaces we strive to be if we embrace being brave and embrace our communities. So during times like these, times of healing and change and growth, when I'm not always certain what the future holds, I turn to the values that I'm uprooted in from my upbringing. So I start today with Al and Mary Palayo, my grandparents. They instilled in me, my siblings and my cousins, the values of Kakua, service, and Kuleana, responsibility. We believe in Kakua to others and our community, regardless of who they are or their background, because all are part of our family or our ohana and deserve our help. My grandparents demonstrated a life of service to us by growing the Hawaiian community in Los Angeles away from our homeland creating civic clubs, festivals, and supporting hula schools, perpetuating a cultural life for Hawaiians in California. They helped to expand our community and ensure future generations were connected to our culture, even if we were unable to live on the land of our ancestors, because that is our kuleana. So these are the values that I rely upon as a leader and a library worker to push me forward. We are all a part of many different communities, including the community of library workers and leaders, which we are all a part of. Using Kokua and Kuleana, our library community works together to uplift diverse voices and work against censorship. Our community encourages our patrons' right to read, and our community resists those who wish to silence us, and we uplift each other with our voices. We must be brave and be heard and speak up and speak out for ourselves and our communities. And the best way we can do this work is to speak with a collective voice, to come with a collective message and to work together towards not only the freedom to read, but also the freedom to liberate. But how do we activate our community in that way when it feels like we are often so alone, especially right now? When activating, I turn to Bell Hooks's idea that not only do communities sustain life, but that quote, one of the most vital ways we sustain ourselves is by building communities of resistance, places where we know we are not alone, end quote. This idea shows me that activation is possible when we work together and not feeling alone, that we are not alone, and it's difficult when we've been isolated from one another. Reconnecting with our communities can be difficult when we are hanging on by a bare thread ourselves, and some days it's not even a thread, right? I know for me, when I was underemployed for years after library school, struggling to find full-time work, and even now when I sometimes struggle to find my professional community, I turned to ALA and I am inspired by all of the leaders standing up for our shared values and resisting on our behalf. I am inspired by those who know that our role as library workers is to help liberate individuals to learn and grow and see themselves in the library and to build communities to ensure a strong future. We know that LGBTQ youth who feel seen are less likely to inflict self-harm. And we know that children who can picture themselves in Wakanda or on Mars or as a doctor or a love interest because they see those who look like them portrayed will grow up to be confident whole members of society. And we know that people being whole members of society can be threatening to those who use systemic oppression to remain in power. And this is scary to those who see that system, a system that was built deliberately, cracking and changing. And this is scary to those who know like we do, 
that libraries are the key to community building and restoring our communities to their whole selves. And I say this also as president of an institution that has its own sordid history that we are reckoning with. And as a member of a profession that didn't always believe that every single person, regardless of race or class, had a right to participate. I recognize the bravery, fight, and resistance of those who came before me to make it even possible for a continent-born, mixed-race, Native Hawaiian woman to be the first Pacific Islander president of the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association and the American Library Association. I honor folks who modeled resistance and community building in ALA and out, like our founders of the National Associations of Librarians of Color, who allowed me to see I and everyone might have a place in ALA and in our libraries. And those who built and continue to build up institutions in direct responses to injustices within the system, in turn, push the system to change. The late John Lewis said, you must be bold, brave, and courageous and find a way to get in the way. And that is exactly what we need to do to make the change on the national level and the local level right here in our own libraries because changes happen all around us. Nothing is forever, not even the Dewey Decimal System or the Library of Congress. We celebrated the change from the Library of Congress last year to change an outdated subject heading from illegal aliens to illegal non-citizens, while recognizing it's a good start, with more work to go to shift to a term like undocumented immigrants. We build on the work of folks like Dorothy B. Porter, who changed and challenged the racist Dewey Decimal System to properly classify works by Black scholars, not in 326 for slavery or 325 for colonization, but in the subject areas they belonged. I modeled this example of resistance in my own library and reclassified numerous works by and about indigenous mythologies and creation stories from the 398 folktale and fairy tale classification to the religion section where they belonged, along with Greek mythology and Norse mythology. We have the power to recognize what needs to be changed on the local levels, as well as the national levels, and we have the power to change them. But before we can do that, we do need to recognize what needs to be changed and make the plan to do it to make the plan that makes us the anti-racist institutions we must become. In my little over 10 years as an active ALA member, I have seen the shift in focus and the continued push towards diversity and inclusion. The desire to make our organization anti-racist, but the frustration with figuring out how to get there when we're all operating with different definitions and understandings of not only equity, diversity, and inclusion, which, side note, the ALA Office for Diversity, Literacy, and Outreach Services has a great shared definition that we can start from. But not only because we have different understandings of the foundation of this work, but because we have different understandings of how this work must be done in order to be successful. We've had over 20 years of spectrum scholars, and the profession's diversity needle has barely moved. Much anecdotal evidence points to difficult environments for people of color, working in systems where we are often the only one, where we have to explain ourselves over and over again, where we are not trusted and uplifted and have to struggle to be heard. Programs like Spectrum show the value of what a community can do for BIPOC and for all of us, even if we do feel alone, and show us how we can use bravery to get in the way and make good trouble. And local groups like Na Hawaii Imiloa for the University of Hawaii Native Hawaiian students make the space to be Kanaka or to be Native Hawaiian and share with each other what it understand and understand what it means to be in a profession in a colonized world and a colonized profession and how we can move forward from that. I want to emphasize also, though, that inclusion and diversity are not limited to race, although we start there because race is the greatest predictor of one's life outcome. I want to recognize that our institutions are also not built for our disability communities, our neurodivergent communities and colleagues, and the need for universal design to be incorporated into our work is essential right now. So what can we do? What can we do as a community right now for this, for all of this? 
How can we support the resistance necessary to make real change as we continue living with COVID? We are poised perfectly for that real change coming out of the last few years that actually made many programs more accessible for folks by going virtual and or hybrid and incorporating those principles as best we can and advocating for the budgets necessary to make that happen going forward. We don't have to go back to all in person. We don't have to go back to packing ourselves in like sardines and focusing on people who are comfortable in large crowds and extroverted ways of living, says this highly introvert, especially after the last few years. We can incorporate the voices of the many and create things that are for those who need them and will benefit them rather than focusing on the needs solely of quote, the majority. We can start by actually listening to and reading the words and demands of those being brave, of those resisting, of those resisting with love, who are trying to make us all better and connecting action with those words. Sometimes that means getting out of the way and letting someone else take the lead. Sometimes that means putting money towards donations to programs like Spectrum or our national associations of librarians of color or memberships to organizations like ALA or on your home institutional level going fine free. Sometimes that means feeling the weight of responsibility and of being of service to your community. It is intentional that the folks whose names and mana I've invoked today are all people of color, most of them women. I use these examples and I elevate these stories and quotes and ideas to emphasize what happens when we are brave and listen to our resistors and see the change that happens in our communities and our profession when we are of service to and are responsible for each other. Four, ALA is a place for us to be of service to one another and our values, to work together to make the world that we want to see, to try out new ideas and make change. It is not easy. It is often slow and it is often difficult and the work should not be entirely altruistic. We get things back from our investment in our national associations. Sure, there are webinars and discounts and conferences, but there are also skills and leadership development that will take us and our cause even farther. I learned the best project management skills through ALA. Coordinating volunteers across the country with varying levels of capacities to work towards a common goal, many of them deans and managers and me a children's librarian. While we, get, while we definitely get all of that in libraries, we get it on steroids in our national associations. My supervisory skills continue to be honed by pseudo supervising volunteers who don't have payment hanging over their head as a motivator. I've had to learn how to motivate groups and I've had groups and networks that I could rely upon to help bring clarity to my day-to-day -day work. Was my library unique in its challenges? Were my managers unique in their shortcomings or their strengths? I learned that rarely was my library unique and often our challenges are shared. And by sharing with others outside of my library, California and heck even the US now, as ALA has a fair amount of international members, I learned new perspectives on how to move forward the work than how to be brave for my community. But it is not always easy being of service to ALA, being of service to our communities and our libraries, and being of service to ourselves. As the great Leslie Nope Aspirer, I had to learn that shirking sleep and all other responsibilities for the library good is not realistic. The number of times I've had to say no to preserve my own sanity until I could come back to the work, while it probably should be a higher number, should also be celebrated. And you should celebrate the times that you balance yeses, nos, and your capacity. To do the work of real change, we have to make sure we are doing it with intention and meaning and within the capacity that we have. Burnout is real. Some of us may be there right now as we are here in this space and the real work that we need to do together on top of the work that we do on a daily basis on behalf of our institutions and our families and our friends is not small or light work. We have to constantly restore ourselves to be there for others and find that joy. But for those of us who are in power and can also make change, we also need to advocate for our colleagues and staff who do not have that same power so that they don't burn out. 
encourage taking those vacation days and monitor the workload. We are all asked to do more and more and more. And at some point we cannot take on any more and have to say no, but we need the support of those hierarchically above us with the power to do so, to put a stop to that continuous build. We live in a capitalistic society. We understand that but we don't have to perpetuate the pain and trauma that comes with it, particularly in a service profession. We have to advocate for fair, safe, and equitable working conditions and fair pay. We have to embrace the systemic mechanisms we have to do to do that, like ALA's Allied Professional Association, an established organization that currently provides certification and salary surveys to the profession, but which ALA President-elect Emily Drabinsky and I hope to grow into an advocacy arm for library workers, which is what we need right now. But we cannot do these things alone. Advocacy at all levels takes organizing. And when we do that work together, when we organize together, the load gets lighter and we build community along the way. And we grow and shape our own futures together. Hawaiian scholar and activist Haunani K. Trask said in her defining book from a native daughter, resistance must be its own reward. We often will not see the fruits of our labor, especially when we are talking about justice in our lifetime. We must trust that our resistance will set the stage and make the path for those who follow us easier so that their resistance builds to create communities of love and strength that we were never, never able to imagine or envision together. When I hosted our first ALA Connect Live of my presidency, I heard from individuals facing book challenges and censorship head on in their school library, in their state, and in their public library. Each individual resisted the forces working against them, a task which is not always easy and can take a mental and physical toll in a way that worked for their community and their individual style. Having a network of allies to call upon at a moment's notice encouraging their students to speak up and fighting for legislation to ensure that every reader has their book and every book has their reader, regardless of how outside forces want to moralize society is exactly how we resist and continue to resist on a daily basis in libraries of all types and by all library workers. So I ask you all today, how will you resist? More importantly, how will you build community? How will you root yourself in love to do this work? in service or responsibility or both. And I also wanna be clear, I am not asking us to further engage in vocational awe as Vavazi Attar talks about. And vocational awe, the navel gazing belief that libraries are inherently good, the belief that often keeps us from doing the hard work of changing our libraries and our cultures because it questions our supposed inherent worth. I am talking about the responsibility we have, one which I feel Atar also asks of us to push vocational awe aside and look at libraries in the raw, to embrace critique, to improve, to deconstruct, to bring in new ways of knowing and classifying and amplifying the work of folks like Dr. Sandy Littletree, who teaches about the intersections of indigenous systems of knowledge in the library. I ask us all here today to identify one or two things that are barriers to being the anti-racist institutions we need to be in order to show up for ourselves as library workers and show up for our communities. It can seem like something as simple as signage, like Hawaii's public libraries having dual language signage in both Olelo Hawaii and English, or incorporating traditional cultural practices into outreach by providing an intergenerational story and activity hour that promotes Hopi language learning through the Hopi Public Library Bookmobile. Start small and dream big. And if you're not already involved, I have to say this because I'm ALA president, but I also believe it. I hope you'll all join me in ALA as we identify what needs to be done and do this work. Passionate people make up ALA as seen in this photo of spectrum scholars and non-spectrum scholars but supporters with past ALA president and librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. There are many ways to do passionate good work. While serving on committees and volunteering is one way, it is not the only way to make ALA better. ALA is a member-driven organization. Each of us is ALA. When we speak out on blogs or Twitter or to school and library boards, we are speaking as ALA. When we say ALA needs to do this, 
say that all the time. That is us, actually. It's not a giant institution. It has an amazing staff of over 200, but a membership of 50,000 that can make a wave and make a difference. And speak out to create a wave we must because our trusted library spaces have now become political battlegrounds for those who proclaim to be in favor of free speech and the First Amendment, as long as it aligns with their values and ideals and will support their political outcomes. Last year, two years ago now in 2021, ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom tracked the highest numbers of challenged and banned books in its 20 year history. 729 challenges to library, school, and university materials and services resulted in more than 1,597 individual book challenges or removals. By comparison in 2019, because 2020 is a mythology of a year that they say happened, but who knows, there's no statistics. Also, not everybody remembers. In 2019, ALA tracked 377 challenges in which 566 books were targeted. Half, that is half the number that would come in 2021, a number that doubled in less than two years. And preliminary numbers for 2022, just from January to October, in 10 months, 781 challenges were reported resulting in 1,835 individual challenges. In those 10 months alone, we surpassed the number of individual challenges of 2021 because the reports coming in are grouping lists of books together, whereas previously they were individual titles coming forward for complaint. And these lists are organized efforts from organized groups and to be clear, our organized attacks against the freedom to read and the freedom of speech by a vocal and aggressive minority. And what are they banning? We know what they are. Books by and about LGBTQIA plus and black and indigenous people of color authors, characters and histories. They are banning us under the guise of being sexually explicit, pornographic, anti-police and promoting specific social agendas. We know that the target is inclusion and identities and stories that have been historically silenced to keep those in power in power. The intersection of social justice and intellectual freedom to many is a difficult one to grasp, but to me, they need each other. We need intellectual freedom to bring stories that get us to justice to light. As a child, I didn't have access to my own history as a native Hawaiian in history books. I didn't understand the overthrow and occupation of Hawaii at the hands of American capitalists for their own benefit. All I knew was that my grandparents left and it was and still is not easy to return because of soaring costs, danger to native Hawaiians and our land and over-reliance on the tourism economy and a feeling of not being welcome in your own home. If I'd had access to and an understanding of the fraught history of my people, just as books like the 1619 Project are bringing forward, we might have been able to figure out how to build a better path forward together sooner and how to integrate equity into diversity and inclusion more intentionally, rather than assuming equality was the next step and goal. The essentialness of equity, diversity, inclusion, and social justice and intellectual freedom are inherent. And when we pair them with principles like radical empathy, trauma-informed response and cultural humility, we can see when arguments of neutrality are helpful and when they are not, and when we need to utilize other tools to ensure all who come through our doors feel seen, heard, and like they belong, regardless of those who want to silence them on the outside. Because silencing is one of the real reasons that books are being challenged. Individuals seeking to silence diverse ideas and ultimately people. To silence these challenges, need, these challengers need to abolish free and equitable access to information, and they need to erode this country's commitment to freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and the freedom to read. When we allow a minority to trample on these freedoms, we encourage our youth to repeat the societal mistakes and perpetuate the divides ignited by cultural ignorance and lack of understanding of the lives of others and a minority of people it is that support book bans. In a bipartisan poll conducted early in 2022, 
ALA found that 71% of voters across party lines oppose efforts to remove books from public libraries. Most voters and parents hold librarians in high regard, have confidence in their local libraries to make good decisions about what books to include in their collections, and agree that libraries in their communities do a good job offering books that represent a variety of viewpoints. So with these statistics in mind, I invite all of you to unite with us against book bans and make your voice heard in the public arena that we need to stop these efforts and ban together. We need to ask our policymakers to reject any efforts to ban books and allow individuals and parents to make decisions about what they and their families read. So please visit United against, uniteagainstbookbans.org to learn more and join our efforts and take this message beyond the library world to our friends, families, and allies in all arenas to use the tools we have to help communities uphold our rights and privileges. For we cannot do this alone. We need our friends. We need our family. We need everyone who supports the freedom to read to help us. And the website has some tools for that. And I'm sure all of your expertise will also go a long way. But online, the Unite Against Book Bans Toolkit includes talking points for anyone, which can be used for writing a letter to your local school or library board, state legislators and governor, the basis of public comments to be given to elected bodies. They can also be used to help folks draft letters to the editor of local newspapers or in speaking with members of the media. There are tools to also help folks identify and contact their decision makers. We all know this. We all do this every day as library workers, but we need to empower those around us to use their voices and encourage public input, which is of course very important for school and library board members, trustees, and state legislators who are almost all local elected positions. If they wanna be reelected, these elected officials therefore take the views of residents and voters seriously, or should, and seek to represent the voices of their community. And as we approach the next election cycle, there's also a candidate questionnaire so if folks are involved in a local political organization, trade union, advocacy group, I've seen some state library chapters use this like other influential community organizations. The candidate questionnaire is a great tool to help assess local candidates running for office and their position on book bans to make it public. And the toolkit also has tips for grassroots organizing and to raise awareness to the issue, stage peaceful protests and more. All things, again, that we as library workers do in our everyday work, but that not everybody really understands and knows is happening. So we need to create the community to support us. And what is ALA doing? What is ALA doing for those that are experiencing challenges? At ALA, the Office for Intellectual Freedom is supporting our library workers with one-on-one -on -one guidance from staff expertise and support to talk through problems, provide guidance on policy creation, share talking points, attend meetings, and identify local support and local attorneys to assist. This work is all confidential and behind the scenes to protect those facing these challenges and ensure as much as we can that they don't face continued repercussions. If library workers are facing discrimination in the workplace or have lost their job while defending intellectual freedom, we also support the Merit Fund, which provides financial assistance for library workers in the midst of discrimination of challenge crises. I encourage you all, if you have the means to please donate to the fund. In just two short months last year, the Merit Fund supported four individuals when the yearly average used to be two. Inquiries continue to come in and we are seeing record numbers and record requests. ALA also provides policy guidance and support at ala.org slash challenge reporting. ALA selection and reconsideration policy toolkit for public school and academic libraries provides library staff, administrators, and trustees suggestions and information on why we choose the titles we add to library, school, media center, and classroom collections. If you are experiencing a challenge, please make sure you report it. And if you need help in whatever realm it is, please know that we are here to support you. And as I say that, we also know that support is not enough. We are looking for ways to be proactive in this fight because we know it isn't going away anytime soon. 
it is time for us to lead the strategy and we are working on ideas that we hope will take us there over the next year or so and that I hope to share with you all soon. The fight, all of them, all of the fights that we are fighting in our libraries, not just against censorship, but also against white supremacy and oppression and the fights for funding and safe workspaces are all advocacy. And they are all long-term fights for that is really how systemic change is made. That system wasn't made overnight and it will take a long time to dismantle it. And we need each other to do that. And advocacy takes many shapes. And I encourage all of us to be not only our own advocates, but again, advocates for each other. As we start heading towards the end, I'd like to invoke Hawaii's Queen Kapiolani's Olelo no Eau, Hulia i Kanu'u, which means strive for the summit. It is a saying that encourages us all to continue striving towards better, towards good, towards excellence. It is up to us to strive and do the work. It is up to us to ensure that the path that was set by the resistors who came before us continues forward and is built upon. And as we strive, I encourage us to be brave, work in community, and take care of one another in the name of justice, to stand up for our values of equity, access, intellectual freedom, and social responsibility, and not cower from critique, but embrace it and embrace resistance. For resistance is the reward, and when we build communities of resistance, we sustain ourselves and know that we are not alone. But most of all, I want us to remember to be brave for our brave communities. The future of libraries, if we are to be truly community focused and community spaces like we are trending towards, is rooted in resistance and love, but also bravery and listening. Encouraging our community members to be partners with us in building our programs and services and defending our freedom to read is essential. So be brave, be vulnerable and purposeful. Know that your voice matters. And know that working in a library, supporting those who work in libraries, getting ready to work in a library is an act of bravery every day. Because each one of us joined here today is a leader. Because every day we are working for true equity, diversity, and inclusion. Every day we are making the intentional choice to make ideas of all kinds available to anyone who wants to learn about them. So please share your idea to improve the library, to improve the association, to improve your school program. Offer to coordinate a project, no matter how big or small. Speak your truth, show up for your colleagues and be supportive of them. And also give yourself a lot of credit and a lot of rest and give yourself the gift of knowing that you've done the best you can and will continue to do the best in the face of adversity because you've already done a lot. So as we close up, I want you all to think of one brave thing you've done for your community and one brave thing you've done for yourself. And again, please remember to kukua, to embrace your kuleana, to build communities of resistance, to be bold, brave, and courageous, and find a way to get in the way. No resistance is its own reward and unite against book bans. And of course, Kulia Ikanu'u. So mahalo for allowing me to be here today. I am so grateful to be here with you virtually. I look forward to hearing about your stories of bravery and resistance and how we can support each other going forward. Thank you. Lessa, thank you so much. That was amazing. While people are thinking of questions, uh, we, we have plenty of time, so please feel free to enter your questions. I wanted to uh, piggyback on a little bit of what you were saying about um, United Against uh, Banned Books. And, you know, and I was very pleased and very grateful that you mentioned the Merit Fund. Um, I think that is so important. I try to donate to that when I can. Um, I wanted to uh, ask about the librarians that are, you know, actually going through lawsuits and the ones who are actually having physical threats. Um, and also on the kind of the flip side of that, we're also dealing with a lot of uh, soft censorship outside the field and also inside the field. So I wanted to know if you had any thoughts about what uh, ALA is talking about, can be doing, you know, for those actually two very extreme parts, you know, of this larger issue. Yeah, absolutely. So some of the ways that ALA specifically is helping is to connect folks with resources. 
right? If they are experiencing harassment, um, to connect them with local entities that can help to protect them, as well as work with their library directors who may not have ever experienced some of this before. Yeah. You know, I think that's one of the really challenging things about leading in this time is what you thought it was going to be is not what it has been at all. And so, you know, just like in parenting, library directors are also figuring it out, you know, as they go along. And I think we have to remember that, that sometimes we also have to tell them what they need. Um, and I didn't mention it directly, but I do want to mention the Freedom to Read Foundation, um, which is an allied, you know, um, organization with ALA that focuses a lot on the legislative impact and can also help be um, co-signers on legislation with the ACLU and with other areas. And so if folks are experiencing these issues to also reach out to the Freedom to Read Foundation um, as a support system. Um, but I think also that what we are working on right now in ALA is um, creating a lot of trainings for folks who are going through these issues, especially school librarians. Um, there are going to be a series of webinars and such that will be rolling out over the next couple of months that are being tailored. I'm also hoping to focus my um, probably final ALA Connect Live um, on what we can do and how we can support librarians who are going through this. And if they're going through it, um, what those resources are that look like, that, what those resources look like for them as well. Um, because it cannot just, we can't self-care our way out of this. Um, it's not just about boundaries and that kind of thing. It has to be a systemic, a systemic and bottom level um, aid. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so our first audience question is from Tammy. Uh, Tammy wants to know if you have any suggestions for trying to get library systems in slow changing areas to go find free and become more inclusive. Tammy said that she was inspired by her MLIS program and ALA programs about more equitable practices, but she doesn't see them locally. She tried to get involved with her local board of trustees, but and she says she was basically laughed away. And she said that she's not sure how to proceed. Yeah, so find free is a, it is a slow journey to get to. So my library just went fully find free um, at the beginning of this last school year. Um, we had been talking about going find free for many years but it takes a lot of convincing of the board to be able to do that and in an administration that is all in. And so what I had uh, talked about recently with one of our librarians who's been here for 20 years, right? She's been talking about going free since she got here for 25 years is planting the seeds and having the patience to know that it is going to be a long journey and proving what that journey looks like every step of the way. So seeing when circulation goes down and comparing your statistics. Statistics speak to a board like bread on butter, right? Mm -hmm. So being able to say these areas are not checking out books. These areas also have a really high number of cards that are blocked. Being able to show those kinds of things are really important as well as being able to articulate the barriers that come with library fines and fees to what are oftentimes historically marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. And so being able to make that argument and show examples of other places where it has been successful has been really helpful. And also understanding that you don't have to do it all at one time. My library was a little bit hesitant about it, which is why we did it in stages. So we started with children's materials going fine free, just children's, not teen, not adults, to see how it would go and to see how it would impact the bottom line, right? So my library is also a special district library, which our funding means um, it's so based solely off of property taxes. We don't have a city budget or anything like that. So we also have to generate additional revenue through things like passport services and room rentals and get really creative in that. So our board was very nervous about it. So we did a one-year pilot just with children's materials. And then we tried removing fine, uh, fees because we were charging for like DVDs and audiobooks. Removing those slowly eventually led to us being able to just say we are completely fine free. Absolutely. Thank you. So we have a couple of more minutes, so we still have time for questions. Um, Lessa, this may be, you know, taking a little bit of a shift, but you mentioned um, room, room rentals. And I know that that, you know, can, um, <laughs> yeah, you know where I'm going. I know where um, you're going. Yeah. Um, that can become a fraught issue 
um, in terms of, you know, who is allowed to use different rooms and, you know, then that gets caught up with, you know, the fa the fallacy of neutrality and things of that nature. So i um, wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your library does and your thoughts about, you know, that larger issue as well. Yeah, so this again is where a strong library policy comes into play. One where you outline the types of groups that are able to um, to use your room and to rent out your room. So we allow discounts also for nonprofits, but pretty much anybody can, cre can create a nonprofit. So nonprofit does not always mean that you are able to create an inclusive and safe space for those who come in. And one of the things that we also have um, for nonprofits is depending on the fee structure that you're using, you might have to open it up to the public. And so anytime we have one of those things, you know, our policy is fairly broad, but also states that our renters need to need to align with the library's core values, need to align with the library's strategic principles and mission. And our library strategic principles, mission, values all clearly articulate that we believe strongly in equity. We believe in sustainability. We spell it out so that there is no question on what types of behavior is permissible and is not permissible and what types of programs are permissible. So I think that one of the things that get into sometimes a little bit, bit of a gray area, right? You may not always know what the group that's renting your room is for. So we had um, a, a group rent a room recently that on the calendar invite, it said something like voters who, voters who are against poll rigging. Right. And so it was like, okay, so these folks don't believe that the last election was fair. What does that mean? What does that look like as we have our patrons going in and out of the space? And so they're not necessarily doing anything. They're not necessarily saying anything, but we also want to be on alert, right? We want to have more staff on the floor. We want to make sure that, um, this was a closed one, so it was not open to the public, which helped also. So we weren't necessarily endangering our folks to, to go into that space, um, but we were very mindful of what the logistics around it looked like as well. So meeting room rentals are can be very messy. We've been very lucky, I would say, in my community um, to not really have had, had any controversial ones. Mm -hmm. um, and, and folks know kind of um, that we are not going to tolerate it, I think mm -hmm. is also what helps us. Yeah, yeah. That was a meandering answer, so no, 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 I mean, it's it's a complicated <laughs> issue. And I think, you know, a lot of people don't know how to deal with it. I think it relates to what you said about directors, just like parents are figuring it out as they go along. I mean, we're in a very different world than we were five, 10 years ago, right? So many different or much different uh, and more complicated problems. So with that um, kind of train of thought in mind, what would you say uh, to the students on today's call, you know, that are aspiring information professionals? Um, what is it that they need to know? If they were coming to you for um, a position, what are some of the things that you might look for uh, in, in new uh, information professionals? So the things that I look for, because I do, I am a hiring manager. Um, I hire on-call librarians who are traditionally fresh out of library school or finishing up their degrees. Um, I believe that a lot of what happens, especially in public libraries, the nitty gritty of it, we can teach that. Yeah. We can teach you how to check out a book. We can teach you how to use the catalog. We can teach you how to fix a record. But what we can't teach is enthusiasm and passion. And so that's what I'm really looking for in folks are folks who know what libraries are, um, folks who are coming in with a good idea and a good vision of the kind of impact that they want to make also, maybe some ways that they think that they can make that impact. Um, but folks who just really care and folks who also, I think, have a good sense of boundaries, especially in a public library setting. You know, one of the questions that we often ask is dealing with, quote, the difficult patron. You know, what happens if someone is yelling at you for something that's not your fault? Or what happens, you know, also if we're dealing on the front lines with folks who are experiencing homelessness or don't have the resources that they need, how do you help them? And so we're also looking for folks who can be empathetic, 
um, who can connect to resources, but who also can protect themselves and who aren't going to get burnt out right away. Mm -hmm. And so starting to think of the ways that you set those boundaries with patrons, I think is really important. And especially in practicing that language, because it's not always easy when you have someone in front of you and your heart is bleeding and you want to take them under your wing and help them and, and do whatever you can. It's not always possible. And so really having a strong sense of self and what you can and can't do, I think is really important for right now. Yeah. in the hiring process. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. And, you know, just to um, add to that, I think that this applies to any library type. So our academic librarians, school librarians, you know, you're going to need boundaries in any setting. Absolutely, absolutely. So that was it for our questions. Um, please join me in thanking Lessa for this amazing session. We are so grateful that you are joining us today and kicking off our 2023 season. And for our audience members, thank you all so much for joining us today on a Thursday afternoon. Um, Sierra just popped the link into the chat. She'll pop it in again. We hope that you will join us for the rest of our series. Um, like I said, today is the beginning of a five week series. Uh, and we have some great speakers uh, that have a high bar to live up to after Les's talk today. So we are very grateful and grateful for you for attending. So everyone be well, have a good weekend. Um, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you, Lessa.